Okay, so hello everyone. So let's begin my, my talk. So rendering technologies behind, behind Gran Turismo 7, VR, ray tracing, and sky simulation. I hope you to enjoy. Uh, I'm Kentaro Suzuki, a lead graphics engineer in Polyphony Data. I have been working for Polyphony Data for uh, about 10 years and have been involved in the Gran Turismo series. This is the agenda for today's talk. Let me give you an introduction first. Gran Turismo is a driving simulator that celebrated its 25th anniversary last year and is a racing simulation game featuring realistic physics and graphics. The latest Gran Turismo 7 was released in March last year. Gran Turismo 7 has a lot of features like dynamic time and weather transitions, ray tracing support, and more. So this slide shows uh, some of the rendering features of Gran Turismo 7. As you can see, there are so many features. Today, due to limited time, I will discuss three features highlighted in yellow. PlayStation VR2 support, hardware real-time ray tracing, and sky simulation for dynamic time and weather transition. First, I will start uh, for talking about uh, PlayStation VR2 support in Gran Turismo 7. VR features were added for the launch of PlayStation VR 2 on February 22 this year. All races can be played in VR, and you can also play VR showroom, a dedicated car viewing mode. But this was uh, not an easy update. While VR allows for a highly immersive experience, it can easily trigger an uncomfortable experience. This is uh, because there is a mismatch between the user's expectations and the visuals they see. And it is called a phenomenon called VR sickness. Therefore, uh, therefore uh, corresponding VR increases was uh, most the important, most important goal for us. And with the PSVR 2 technologies, uh, we were able to achieve this. This slide represent uh, our, this, this, this slide is a uh, show a methodology to avoid VR sickness. First, a clear rendered image is required. In other words, it must be high resolution. Next, a response time must be good. User actions must be uh, immediately re reflections on the screen. It also needs to follow the user's head movements. Therefore, high FPS and high refresh rates are required. Furthermore, there must be visual consistencies such as depth and left right image consistency. This is achieved by optimizing the user interface. Finally, the camera should not move against the user's um, intentions or expectations. Fortunately, this is not a big problem in racing games. As you can see, a uh, lot uh, rendering performance and the game design are constrained a lot. So it's quite difficult for existing games to support VR later. To summarize, these are the technical requirements for present VR experience. I will now explain how we achieved. First, let's look at about the PlayStation VR's uh, hardware specs. PSVR 2 has an HDR 4K panel. It also has a 6D or motion tracking, and we can use gauge tracking features. The PlayStation VR 2 panel has a high, re high resolution and is displayed to the user, th user through a non-linear lens. The left image is a source image we need to render, and the right image is uh, the panel output image. Uh, due to this non-linearity, the rendering resolution required one point times the panel resolution. This is 2.84 times rendering pixels of 4K full resolution image. 
rendering an image with this much pixel is very, very high cost. Actually, due to the non-linearity of the lens space, the edge of the source rendered image can, be, can have a lower resolution. In other words, it would be nice if we, can, if we could rasterize non-linearly. PSVR2 can do this. PlayStation 5 GPUs had, uh, has a hardware feature uh, called flexible scheduled rasterization. This function performs non-linear rasterization based on non-linear curves set on the screen. This allows a practical quality to be achieved even when the ratio of panel resolution to rendering resolution is about one by one. As a result, we can lower rendering costs significantly. In addition, uh, for who the rendering could be performed. PlayStation VR2 has gauge tracking features. This feature can be uh, used to selectively increase the rendering resolution in the user's line of sight. This can further improve rendering quality while maintaining rendering cost. It can also reduce the uh, cost while maintaining the co uh, rendering quality. Another issue is now to uh, achieve a high, re high refresh rate. Rendering at refresh rates such as 90 hertz or 120 hertz while maintaining quality was difficult due to load constraints. This is why the reprojection function is used. This function renders at 60 hertz and displays the screen at 120 hertz. The rendering results are converted and displayed according to the posture of the head mount display at the time of display. In general, object movement blur remains, but this is relatively harmless in racing games. By using this, the features uh, introduced so far, we achieved high rendering performance and high refresh rates. Next, let's look at the user interface. In VR, the user, the user interface must have a consistent, uh, must, must be consistent front-to-back depth relationship. Therefore, we wrote the user interface in 3D space. It, it is important to position it in an easily viewable position so that it will not interfere with other uh, 3D objects. We wrote important items on the foot where they can be easily seen while driving. It's convenient for checking uh, with the little or no eye movement. On the other hand, uh, we wrote not so important items near the center console. It does not interfere with driving. This image shows the user interface in non-VR. This image here is a user interface in VR. Frequently checked information is placed together in the back of the 3D space. Occasional information is placed together in, an, in unobtrusive locations. In addition, existing 3D models uh, such as meters, uh, etc., are used as user interface directly without modification. Now, the user interface is uh, optimized. We have a VR experience that uh, takes care not to cause VR sickness. PlayStation VR 2 has PC D60, D65 HDR panels. It is not as strong peak brightness as high-end HDR TVs, but HDR feeling is very high for us. For example, we can have higher realism of sunset and rich tone in dark areas. We cannot say, we cannot say for sure, but we believe that uh, the wide viewing angle and close viewing environment may have an impact. Here is a summary of our PlayStation VR2 support. We achieve high performance using the PlayStation 5 features for optimizing for VR. Additionally, we accomplished gameplay that is com comfortable and free of depth contradiction by optimizing to the user interface. We also attained realistic lighting by uh, leveraging uh, the wide-angle HDR panels. 
Next, we discuss hardware ray tracing support. The reason for the ray tracing support is, of course, the hardware ray tracing support in PlayStation 5. As hardware, it provides only basic functionality. However, it is well supported in the SDK and provides an easy to use environment. The samples are also extensive and provide many hints on how to use them. The effect of accurate reflections, which is one of the strengths of straight ray tracing, is especially easy to see on shiny materials like cards. In addition, the uh, real cards are designed to, designed to include reflections, so it was necessary to support accurate reflections to accurately reproduce the real curve. Now, let me show you a few results from our ray tracing implementations. The effect of ray tracing are, the, the effect of ray tracing are easy to see in scenes like this, where reflections are used very extensively. As you can see, it can also handle reflections on more complex curved surfaces. In addition, reflections of slightly rough metallic surfaces are realist realistically represented. Now, let me explain the implementation. These are the basic policies. First, we decided not to apply ray tracing during races where FPS is the highest priority. This decision reduced performance constraints and saved us from creating dedicated assets as much as possible. As a result, we were able to keep artist costs down. And uh, we also decided not to allocate too many development costs because we had a lot of other work to do. The SDK's PSR, PSR library was well de developed, which which help us significantly and reduce development cost. Now, let's look at the actual implementation. I will begin with a brief description of the ray tracing API in PSR. PSR has a ray tracing API that supports a two-level acceleration structure. It provides a simple ray casting API on GPUs and it has uh, almost the same e functionality as the ray tracing APIs, such as DirectX. Then, how is it used for rendering? Before I discuss the use of ray tracing, I will, de I will describe the basic rendering structure in Gran Turismo 7. Our rendering system is a forward rendering system using physically based rendering with Disney BRDF and pre-integrated IBL. Forward rendering is used to use complex materials such as cut paint and special shaders for road surfaces and grass. Another reason we use it is to achieve 4K full resolution. Next, let's look at the specular GI. Specular GI calculations in Gran Turismo rendering before ray tracing had relatively low approximation accuracy. This was because screen space reflections could not, could not be used to achieve specular GI and on only pre-integrated Q maps should be, could be used. In other words, to, uh, local reflections and local occlusions uh, accuracy was very low. Therefore, we decided to apply ray tracing to improve the accuracy of specular GI. Here is a previous rendering result uh, without ray tracing. Here is a rendering result with ray tracing. Here is a compa comparison. As you can see, uh, with ray tracing, uh, local reflection features are added. Also, the effect of specular GI with ray tracing in the car interior is highly effective. So there are benefits in rendering other than smooth mirror-like surfaces. Here is a rendering uh, result without ray tracing. Here is a rendering result with ray tracing. Here is a comparison. 
as you can see, uh, with ray tracing, not only reflections, but local occlusions are added. Next, let me, uh, let me explain how we use ray tracing for the specular GI calculation. Here is a split sum approximation we use for specular GI IBL calculations before using ray tracing. It's a, method to it's a method to separate and approximate the integral of the rendering equation into a multiplication of two integrals. This is often used in real-time rendering. Each integral is computed quickly by fetching pre-computed pre textures. We could, we could replace this approximation with ray tracing to improve accuracy, but this time, we continue to use the split sum approximation even when ray tracing is used. This decision simplifies calculations, stabilizes filtering during denoising, and reduces the number of G buffer parameters to be output. So very useful for us. And we simply replace a QMAP fetching in split sum approximation with ray tracing. Now, the integration is calculated using ray tracing, and the problem is how to compute the radius L from the intersection point. In this time, to compute the radius, we approximate it with the same method, same shading method we use for rasterization. At the intersection points, we do shading like rasterization instead of recursively ray tracing. Of course, the accuracy will be lower, but a certain amount of GI effect is already account accounted for, and errors in higher order reflection components are less noticeable. Therefore, only one ray tracing step is performed. The final overview of rendering passes is shown in the slide. First, rasterization pass is done. Next, Specular GI is uh, computed with ray tracing on ray tracing pass. The ray tracing results are then composited and processing such as transparency and post effects are performed. I will now describe uh, each rendering pass in detail. The rasterization pass is almost the same process as usual for the rendering, computing direct light and diffuse GI. However, specular IBL is excluded. In addition, additional attributes are output as a scene G buffer, normal, roughness, and specular coefficients. Next, let's look at the ray tracing pass. Ray tracing at 4K full resolution is expensive, so we process in a reduced resolution buffer. As already explained, the integral must be computed, which is done using Monte Carlo integration. However, since the number of samples is small, we will denoise by filter. Okay, so concrete ray casting is done using a thin G buffer. The ray origin is determined from the depth buffer and screen coordinates. And the ray direction is determined from normal roughness and blue noise. Here, GGX important sampling is performed using roughness and noise. Once the intersection uh, with, uh, with an object in the scene is determined by ray casting, the radiance from that point to the ray origin is calculated. This can be achieved by evaluating the function shader associated with the material of the surface. As already explained, this calculation is the same as the shading process in rasterization. And output some attributes to a buffer for use in subsequent filters. The output at this point is shown in the figure. Okay, so you can see that there is a lot of noise. Therefore, denoising is necessary. In this case, we use three different denoising filters. The first one is a sample reusing filter, which is based on the one used in stochastic scoring space reflections. Next is a temporal filter, which increases the number of samples by reprojecting from the history buffer. 
Finally, the spatial filter is a joint bilateral filter that uses luminance, normal, and depth to determine the weight. We use a lot of heuristics to adjust the parameters of these filters. At this point, this is the result. A lot of the noise has been reduced, but it still remains at the edges. So, Temporal anti-alias anti is then applied. This is a reprojection using velocity. However, it must be applied independently of the temporal filter already described. This improves the edges and stabilizes the result in the temporal direction. And this figure is the result. Finally, the reduced buffer result is upscaled using bilateral upsampling. In addition, the speaker intensity buffer is multiplied and, com and, com <coughs> sorry, uh, and converted with a rasterized out combined with a rasterized output. After that, the, the process is exactly the same as without ray tracing. Here is the summary of our ray tracing support. Uh, improved specular GI is achieved using ray tracing, and many filters and heuristics are used to handle the problem. Next, uh, I will discuss the sky simulation. There are two parts about sky simulation, high quality offline sky rendering and its use in real time. First, I want to talk about offline rendering. Our offline sky rendering is a highly accurate atmospheric rendering using measurement-based atmospheric models. This is a real photograph of the sky. But basically, what is skylight? In the atmosphere, incoming light interacts with small particles, changing the direction of propagation from the original one. This phenomenon is called light scattering. There are countless particles floating in the atmosphere that scatter sunlight in different directions. The atmosphere uh, that scatters the sunlight appears to glow. That is skylight. Light scattering is characterized by phase function and particle density. This is a phase function which can be regarded as probability density function of scattering direction of light. Particle density affects the scattering and absorption uh, scat coefficients. These coefficients determine the frequency of scattering and absorption. When considering atmospheric scattering, there are two main types of scattering, Rayleigh scattering and mean scattering. The blue light from Rayleigh scattering makes the sky blue and absorption makes sunset red. On the other hand, me scattering makes the cloud white. Because of the st strong word scattering, the direction of the light is clear. On the, uh, one of the difference between the two is the phase function. A ready scattering is symmetrical forward and backward, slightly weaker at the sides. Me scattering is almost all forward. Let's use a logarithmic scale. Because the particle size is close to the wavelength of the light, the phase function of mean scattering has in such complex shapes due to wave interference. Unfortunately, it is generally hard to use. It's therefore common to define the phase function directly as a simple approximation function. In addition, it is often assumed that the scattering and absorption coefficients for both Rayleigh and mean scattering vary only with density height. But how good are these assumptions in existing simulations? First, let, let us look at the case of Rayleigh scattering. Let me conclude first. Existing approximations seem to be sufficient for both the phase function and the, scat and the uh, density distribution. This figure shows the original phase function and the approximated function. As you can see, they are very close. Then, what about density distribution? These are two 
The two measurements based the distribution of atmospheric molecules, US standard 1976 and NRLMSIS. Furthermore, the experimental approximation is indicated by the red line. As you can see, they are very close again. For miscattering, on the other hand, existing approximation seems insufficient for both the phase function and the density distributions to achieve our goals. This is mainly due to the complexity of the particle size distribution. In reality, the particle size distribution of miscattering has two peaks. One is the uh, fine mode, and the other in the coarse mode. This affects the phase function. This figure shows the uh, shape of the phase function derived from the fine mode and the coarse mode. The approximated phase function from existing simulations are shown by the red line. As you can see, the accuracy of the approximation is not good. In addition, the vertical density profile of the air door is shown in the figure. The approximated density profiles from existing simulations are shown by the red line. As you can see, the accuracy of the approximation is again not so good. Based on these findings, we developed a measurement based offline sky renderer. Airdor distribution can be freely layered by altitude, a numerically derived phase function based on the measurement distribution is used. Scattering and absorption coefficients are also based on that distribution. This, this enabled us to reproduce a rich representation of the sky. Yes, we've got what we've desired. Of course, this is CG simulated sky. Notice the light spreading out over the sun. No loss of contrast even in haze. OK, so next I will talk about the real time rendering. We convert the result of light uh, high quality offline rendering into lookup tables for real time rendering. In addition to achieve dynamic and time weather changes, we, are, we use a com combination of multiple atmospheric condition lookup tables. This is an overview of our lookup table. We render sky images in two, uh, two axes, time and weather, and uh, converted them into lookup tables. Each lookup table is a 2D texture array of 64 slices and corresponds to a sing single weather condition. And each slice contains a sky spherical radiance corresponding to a particular time. In addition to that, adaptive mapping is performed for each slice to save texture resolution. This figure is an ordinary uh, uh, long latitude longitude mapping. And we apply a horizontal normalization. Further, we apply a nonlinear uh, adaptive transformation of the V coordinates. This video shows how the lookup table is mapped to the sky and how the sky is decorated. The left image is the lookup table uh, slice, and the right image uh, is the sky decorated. The red areas on the left and the right correspond. As you can see, there is more texture density around the sun and the near the horizon. Also, the overall, the overall mapping is very nonlinear. Next, how do, we, how do we represent weather changes with lookup tables? In our project, we call the sky corresponding to the various atmospheric conditions, the basic sky. We use combinations of the basic skies to represent the changes from clear skies to cloudy, rainy sky. First, I will explain the basic skies for clear sky. For the air door distribution representing clear skies, here we define only the two, two extreme distributions, each of which is a lookup table. So the air door diversity is represented by the linear interpolation of these two lookup tables, clear and haze. Next is about the basic skies for cloudy sky. Since the scattering changes rapidly during the formation of high clouds, we prepared six basic skies for cloudy skies to improve the accuracy of interpolation. 
This results in natural weather transitions. Here is an overview of interpolations of basic skies. Two parameters, haziness and cloudiness, are used to interpolate uh, the each lookup table. This is an example result of our weather transition with clouds. As you can see, the weather transition between clear and cloudy sky uh, very express, is uh, expressed very well. Okay, finally, I will give a summary of my presentation. Today, we talked, I, I talked about PlayStation BR2 hardware, hardware PlayStation BR2, hardware real-time ray tracing, and sky simulation in Gran Turismo 7. These features are the result of collaboration between engineers and artists. There are also several other rendering features in Gran Turismo 7 that we did not have time to introduce today. Maybe we will introduce them again when we have a chance. And this is the acknowledgement slide and my final slide of today's talk. Thank you for your kind attention. And now, please welcome Graham Aldridge. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Graham Aldridge. I'm here from Bend Studio. And I am an R&D engineer, which basically means I get to do what I want. So today, I'm here to talk to you about screen space shadows. And I'm basically going to give you a high level from basics to basics to high level implementation overview, including specific information about how they're implemented in a number of released and future Sony titles. So, so super quick, this is going to be very, very quick. What are they? I thought I had to go over this. So, screen space shadows, sometimes also called contact shadows. Well, you can think of them similar to screen space AO, which I imagine most people are quite familiar with. You start with a depth texture. That's all you use. And then somehow, through some magic, we're going to extract micro shadow detail, such as here, localized in a small area of the screen using only depth. And we're going to use this information to hopefully complement our existing less, less micro-y shadowing techniques, such as traditional things like shadow maps. So why would we want to do this? Because we've done this a number of times, so clearly there's a reason. Well, this is an image from one of the games that uses this technique. And if you see this mountain off in the background, it's got an awful lot of trees on it. And these trees are not scaled down, they are full size. So it's actually quite a long way away. And using traditional techniques, this sort of shadowing is actually pretty hard to do. Shadow maps usually don't have that sort of range. So what actually happens in this shot, almost all the shadowing of the trees beyond the lake here are actually done entirely in screen space. And I can prove this by turning them off. And as you can see, things are quite a lot worse. It looks a lot flatter and a lot less detailed. And to prove it, this is what the buffer looks like. This is just the screen space shadowing term. And as you can see, there's an awful lot of micro detail captured here, but there isn't the macro detail. It's just micro detail, which is why these are a very, very useful tool to combine with existing shadows such as shadow maps. So the small scale detail is captured very well. If we zoom in, we can see here that if I toggle on and off, this is capturing lots and lots of detail uh, that otherwise wouldn't be captured. So you can look at the hair, you can look at folds in the clothes, that sort of thing. There's a bunch of stuff being captured. And these sorts of things are very, very hard to capture with non-ray traced techniques. So in certain games where ray tracing just isn't quite feasible yet at these scales, it's a very useful technique. Additionally, one of the things that came out of having a robust screen space shadow uh, system was surprisingly unexpected. You may all be familiar with this. This is what a typical in-game material looks like if you light it you know, with a single light direction. It all looks a bit flat. So later in this presentation, I'm also going to be showing you a technique that we used, a very simple technique that can exploit screen space shadows to make them look significantly better and pull out a lot of detail and make them quite a bit more compelling. But before we do that, 
I'm going to go back to basics. So I have to cover a few things first. I have to cover how you actually do trace array and screen space. So yes, we're going back to coordinate systems 101. But there are three key observations I need to make which are going to make this much, much easier. So here we go. We have our scene. You love my art, don't you? There we go. I've placed a light in the scene, and we're going to apply the standard transformation to get it on screen. Now, the first key observation, this is the easy one, is light travels in a straight line. And interestingly, not only do they travel in a straight line in world space, but due to the projection that we're using, they also travel in a straight line in screen space. That makes things way easier for us, because it means if we're wanting to trace our screen ray, we just iterate towards the projected coordinate of the light. That's all we have to do. So, so far, so good. It's easy. The next observation is if we look at the actual projection code, which we're all hopefully familiar with. And this is a bit harder to visually demonstrate, so I'm just going to point it out. But if we look, the values in the depth buffer are also applying the exact same projection, the divide by w. W being approximately the distance from the camera plane. The side effect of this, and the observation number two, is that means we can also linearly interpolate values in the depth, depth buffer. And there's obviously very good reasons for this. There's a re if anyone remembers the W buffer, there's very good reasons for this. OK, so what happens? We'll push the light off screen, and just for sanity's sake, what happens? Well, the same rules still apply. We still trace our rays in straight lines, but now the coordinate's off screen. If we get really close to the buffer, or sorry, not the buffer, the camera plane, well, the W value gets very, very small. The light shoots off to infinity, but this is still completely valid. It just means that the rays are going to become more and more parallel. Again, coordinate systems 101. So, what happens when things go beyond the camera plane? This is where the interesting observation number three comes out. And I'll admit, I didn't realize this until, you know, not long before I implemented this code. So let's push the light behind the camera plane. So now W has flipped to being negative. And the really interesting thing is it, it reappears on screen, but now it's on the opposite side. And this initially feels a bit weird, but no, coordinate systems being what they are, this is actually great, this is perfect. And observation number three, the unintuitive one, is that we no longer interpolate towards the light, we interpolate away from it. And this guarantees you're still tracing a correct ray in screen space. So knowing these three things, we can very, very easily implement our algorithm. OK, we know how to trace a ray, excellent. How on earth do we get the shadow? So this is Addy at quite low resolution. And this is my ent artistic interpretation of a slice of the depth buffer running through her face. I'm sorry. So we're going to pick a random pixel right here. And we're going to take that light coordinate. In this case, it's way, way off screen. And we're going to you know, interpolate towards it. But it's obviously going in the wrong direction. In this case, W was negative. OK, push the other direction. Real easy. We take a few samples along the ray. And we read the depth value. And then using some magical formula, we're going to compare them to our interpolated depths. And remember, that was observation number two, that we just need to interpolate these depths. And then hopefully, using that, we get an intersection. And hopefully, we get a nice looking shadow. Of course, it's not that quite that simple, is it? It never is. So what goes wrong? Well, if anyone's tried this here, I'm sure you probably know quite a few things go wrong. Uh, the first is disocclusion. Disocclusion is an unavoidable issue, and this is why they cannot replace other shadowing techniques. They can only complement. In this case, portions of her neck are literally not on screen. So there are no pixels there. They cannot cast a shadow. Unfortunately, there's nothing I can do about that. I'm sorry. I'd like to be able to do that. It would be great. Uh, also problematic is undersampling. Everyone knows this. Undersampling is bad. 
Uh, a less obvious problem is depth buffer aliasing. We have aliasing in our depth buffer and we're projecting it into the world. That's not good. And that typically means that a single sample should not produce a full shadow. That's ultimately the way you get around that. How you do that, there's various different ways. But the ultimate conclusion you come to is that you need lots and lots of samples for this to work well. And there are a few different ways to do that. You could either brute force it, you could do something smarter, temporal, jittering, blah, blah, blah. I'm not a fan of those things typically. We brute forced it. So, <laughs> let's zoom in on my lovely little grid. What happens if we sample every single pixel along the ray for a certain distance? Well, uh, spoiler alert, it's bad things. So we're gonna start with this blue guy, that's our pixel, and this is our rough ray direction in screen space. So consider this, consider this direction. Let's map out the pixels we're sampling. It quickly becomes apparent there's actually a new form of aliasing here, a sampling aliasing occurring, because this discontinuity is a really, really big problem. This could represent a huge jump in depth that otherwise isn't occurring along other portions of the ray. And that, you can't predict that, and it could go really, really badly. So, intuitively you think, oh, we'll just put some biasing in, that will work. Kind of doesn't. It just makes everything, well, you lose legitimate detail and you still don't fix the actual bad corner cases. So, our solution, of course, was much more complicated. We performed a full manual bilinear filter with a custom edge detector to detect legitimate edges. Well, so here is an example of an image. This is a pure screen space shadow image. And if you zoom in on the roof here, you can see that there's a lot of problems happening. There's a lot of visual issues. And all these visual artifacts here are ultimately due to those discontinuities. And they are ultimately solved by implementing these types of manual bilinear filters. So if I enable it, you can see the artifacts have gone away. So we've only added like two or three times more cost to reduce a minor artifact, but boy, <laughs> trust me, that minor artifact, will it's a problem. So how many hundred samples are we doing now? It's seeming a little bit expensive, isn't it? Things are a bit bad. Um, it is, but luckily, there's an interesting observation you can make, which actually kind of flips things on its head, and that's why I'm talking to you, to, to you today. Let's go back to our example with the pixel. We are going to consider it's a direct neighbor. So now, little blue pixel has a neighbor. Another blue pixel, I probably should have colored it differently. Things get really interesting when we consider this guy and we compare their two rays. Because remember, these guys are targeting the exact same point. They're interpolating to the exact same point and they're really, really close. So these rays are very, very similar. So if we were willing to make a very, very simple compromise, that compromise being shifting the sampling, starting of the sampling point slightly within the, the pixel, well, we can do something very, very simple, and that is we can move the rays to match. And that means that the sampling locations between these two pixels are going to precisely match. The depths won't match, but that doesn't matter. The important thing is where we're sampling them. Oh, I'm one behind. Now, if we push this, this data into local group shared data memory, local data store, I should say, then in theory we can start sharing this data. So the next step is we extrapolate. In traditional, in traditional rendering, with our typical compute shaders, they're eight by eight, maybe eight by four, that sort of thing. Everyone's used to this. So the key observation here is what we actually do instead is we use a one-dimensional compute shader, 64 by one, by one, and we map it to a segment of the ray. By doing this extremely simple thing, we are now in a really advantageous position because it means that every thread individually only has to sample one sample and its bilinear neighbor, and they can store the results directly into group shared memory. There is a catch, of course, 
That would be a very short ray at the end, so each sample also has to do at least one extended sample based on the number of actual tests we're doing for this shadow. But hopefully you can see there's an awful lot of data reuse happening here. And, of course, once it's in local data share and group shared memory, it's a pretty simple option. We just have to pick a starting point and iterate forward. So let's return to our depth buffer example again. Yeah, I should have, I should have redone this, shouldn't have I? Uh, if you actually overlay the light directions here, another optimization becomes apparent. And this one's a bit more subtle. All these rays are targeting the exact point, the exact same point. So if we apply a very simple division transformation, we can reorientate this data such that all the rays are parallel. This means that your sampling problem becomes even simpler. In fact, it's incredibly trivial. You, you pick your starting value, you iterate forward, and it quite literally boils down to only a couple of instructions per sample including loading the data in order to produce your threshold and produce your shadow term. <laughs> that was one ahead, sorry. So yeah, very computation computationally simple. So just for fun, this is how we visualize the projection of wave fronts towards a light. And as you can see, it's quite a fun thing. Uh, Actually, doing this mathematically is a bit of a pain, so I'm not going to go over this. But uh, you might notice there was a tiny, tiny amount of flickering in the center because there are some values that are being written multiple times. Unfortunately, this is just the nature of how it works, so there is some non-determinism there because we can't necessarily control the order of the GPU. Well, we can, but it's difficult. But in practice, we found this was neither visually a problem nor was it a performance problem. It's only a few percent in terms of the overlap. But otherwise, this core algorithm doesn't rely on any dithering or random noise, so it should be pretty deterministic. As an aside, this one-dimensional mapping has proven really surprisingly useful in a bunch of seemingly unrelated cases. Probably the most notable one is cloud rendering. We've used that to accelerate cloud rendering quite a bit. Uh, terrain shadows, so swept shadows on terrain. A really bizarre one was Bloom because certain cases you can even do divide and conquer within this one-dimensional wavefront. And experimentally, we've used it for god rays, which looked great, but almost looked too good and was needed literally like 10,000 samples to look great. And uh, voxel light transport, which was so cool, but yeah, cache thrashing just kind of killed it. Okay, so Days Gone on the PS4 was the first game to use this technique, and it used it primarily, or only, for the sun shadows. Later titles used it for point and spotlights. And the interesting thing you can see here is actually there's a one pixel edge around some of these trees, and this is simply because a pixel doesn't shadow itself, but it shadows the next one. So that is the screen space effect. All the trees off in the distance on that really, really distant mountain, it's all screen space. Doing that normally with shadow maps or swept shadows would be really difficult. We all know that feeling of this tiny little lit trees off in the distance. That's a really painful problem to deal with. And as I promised, there's another technique. So in this particular shot, I want to be clear, this ground is basically completely flat, you know, PS4. There's a few meshes here and there, but for the most part, this is just flat terrain. And as you can see, there's quite a bit of depth we're capturing out of this. There's very, very little geometry. So how do we extract this micro shadow detail? This is done with a technique we internally call depth bias. And as the name might already imply, it was really, really, really simple. Basically, we started with our regular material, the regular G-buffer exports, such as normal albedo roughness, and we added an additional term, and this was a high frequency depth displacement. This was what we called our depth bias term. This is a visualization, and as you can see, it's high frequency. Low frequency ultimately didn't matter, so this is what we had. And this term was approximately eight centimeters either way. It varied. And we stored it as 12 bits in the G buffer. The way we utilized this term was arguably even simpler. 
we just took the rasterized depth, the depth output from the normal renderer, and we just added the depth bias term to it. And that produced our new texture, and that was then injected to any rendering system that used depth to reconstruct position. That was it, that was the entire technique. And the surprising thing was this didn't just affect shadows. Ambient occlusion, decal blending was a really big, decal blending was a huge one. Uh, puddles, snow, uh, you know, a footstep in our game was just a depth bias decal, that was it. Water effects, all sorts of things, they just magically got these depth bias effects from that term. So, going back to the shader, what about performance? How much does it cost to generate this shadow? Well, it's a compute shader. So, let's say you set it up for 60 samples. So if your wavefront is 64 long, 60 fits within that. It's a nice balanced number. The compiled compute shader was less than 300 instructions, 200 of which was ALU. And if you remember, four texture samples per thread because, of course, it did the one sample bilinear, which is two, and then the extended sample, another two samples. In terms of actual instructions, this broke down to roughly 50-50 setup and iteration. The iteration itself for 60 samples was about, as you can see here, uh, oh, you know, 100 and something instructions. That doesn't matter. So basically, on average, it was less than five instructions per sample. So what does that actually mean for performance? This is fun. So on PS5, let's say you're targeting a native resolution of 1440p, and you want to do the 60 sample shadow, and you want full screen coverage. Let's assume the light is not in the center of the screen, but it's somewhere off screen. You're sampling every single pixel. Well, this shader takes 0.19 milliseconds, plus or minus. So it's pretty cheap. As a final thought, I want to leave you with, this technique isn't for everyone, it's not suitable for every game, and I completely admit that. It's quite fiddly to implement and get right, but if it does work for your game, it's a very, very powerful technique. So, I imagine a bunch of you are sitting here thinking what I would be thinking, which is like, that seems fun, but uh, I don't necessarily have the time investment, that sort of thing, we're too concerned. So, I invite you, to visit bendstudio.com slash SciGraph and download the code. <laughs> and I'm open to any questions you might have. Or if there's no questions, I can sit down. Sorry, uh, I won't let you sit down here. Hi, <laughs> hi. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. The first oh. one, um, so this is in the uh, image space, right? So yeah. what happened for the large occluders that are outside the screen? I guess you would do it in a different pass with the traditional shadowing. Uh, this occlusion, well, from off screen is a problem. Uh, you can potentially render, say, depth very slightly larger than mm -hmm your main view, but primarily this is about getting micro, that micro detail, that crunchy stuff. So hopefully you have, as I say, more typical traditional shadow techniques to fall back on in those cases. I see, for example, like large tree or large building yeah, that is sitting ex exactly. far behind. It's, a, it's similar to, as we say, typical S screen space AO, they already have these issues, and, mm. but uh, yeah. yeah. And my second question is, have you dealt with translucent materials for this technique? No, it purely comes from the depth buffer. I you see. could run a similar algorithm in, the, in a translucent shader, but you would not gain the benefit of the thread-to-thread um, -thread communication to optimize it. Okay, and probably you already answered this one, just to confirm, um, to maintain the consistency when you are moving the camera, mm -hmm. you would render on a larger screen and then you would crop for example, for the small uh, leaves, mm -hmm. and they are disappearing from the screen, so to maintain their shadows, you would render on a larger scale, larger buffer? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not quite. Yeah, for example, let's say we have a decal that is being rendered with the uh, uh, screen space uh, shadowing, mm -hmm. and it's just disappeared, so there's no depth information in the camera space. Mm. 
and yeah. to maintain their shadow, you would render on a larger buffer, I guess? Um, as I say, that is the fundamental limitation of the technique, that it, it can only produce shadows from what's actually in the depth buffer. And so if it's not in the depth buffer, unfortunately, it doesn't produce them. So that's why I can't, I'm not pretending it's going to solve every problem and give you every shadow, because that would be wonderful, but it just doesn't do that. Uh, in theory, as I say, you could potentially render the depth slightly wider, and I think that actually is a feasible thing to be doing in the future. But um, it wasn't honestly a huge issue for us, so. Okay, great, thanks a lot. No problem. I can't actually see anything because yeah. of these lights, so. <laughs> No more questions. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Please welcome Logan Olson and Nasser yes. Khalid. Hello, everybody. How's it going? Nasser will be joining us shortly. It seemed weird having both of us on screen at the same time, so we'll like tag team it. So we're going to talk about 3D asset creation for games using generative machine learning. I'll introduce myself, our team. Uh, we'll talk about the state of 3D generation more broadly, not just within our studio, but just give you a lay of the land if that's something you're interested in. Then we're going to talk about some of our experiments and some of our learnings, and then we'll cap it off with you know, what's next. So my name is Logan Olson. I'm the director of our small but mighty machine learning team. Most of them are back in Montreal, uh, but we have myself and Nasser, our ML researcher specializing in 3D here today. We both come from Haven Studios, uh, who just announced their first new IP. It's an original IP called Fair Games. It's a thrilling, competitive heist game, and the goal is to become a next-gen thief and assemble your crew. And as part of assembling your crew, personalization and customization are a big thing. So when we were working on doing, or as we currently do, uh, machine learning R&D, uh, and we were thinking about how that can help with personalization. Masks, like you see on this monkey crew here, seem like a good target to do exploration. And so we've been working on generating hyper-personalized masks for different players. This gives you a sense for some of the stuff we've been generating. We have like the rainbow skull here. Uh, and what's being generated here, by the way, is uh, the textures and the 3D mesh of the skull and the 3D mesh of the gorilla. This is some of our other early results uh, before they were turned into to meshes. Uh, these start as neural radiance fields. Uh, we're not going to dive into neural radiance fields here, but you can come say hi to us afterwards. There's probably a lot of talks here uh, this week about neural radiance fields, but we use text to get a, a generated neural radiance field in about you know, five to seven minutes. Uh, we quickly fit that into a mesh after the nerf has been generated, and then we texture it afterwards. So this whole process, uh, you know, it's a work in progress, but this whole process, I think, takes about 10 to 15 minutes on an A100. So there's four techniques here. I'm going to talk about the first two. Um, and keep in mind, these are not silver bullets. If you implement them, you might not get exactly what you want, but they've helped us in our like, progress. So the first one is this idea of rendering the normals. So whenever these techniques are applied or mentioned in papers, you sort of render them as RGB images, and you use that information. But it's much better to render them as normals, and that's what we found. It's like, and a normal, just a quick recap, is if you have a surface, a normal points uh, straight up from that surface, so that's X, Y, or Z, and you can convert that into an RGB. So if it's more in the Z, it's going to be more blue, because XYZ, RGB. So what happens is these normal renders end up encoding information about the shape just, by, uh, just through the render itself. So when you optimize using these, what you'll end up with is something that it needs to adjust the shape to really get it there. So a quick example of that would be if you're not using them. So on the open source repos, they do these RGB renders. And what happens is that the skull, like in this case, we wanted a skull mask, but the skull exists in RGB space, but the actual underlying shape isn't there. So it's kind of cheating. And that's what you'll notice with these techniques, is they sort of cheat and hide details in the texture, but they're not really good shapes. But if you drop those RGBs and you render normals, you get smoother, cleaner shapes as you're doing these generations. Cool. And the second idea is this of uh, symmetry and camera easing. So when you're generating something like a mask, ideally you want it to be the same on either side of the face, so you have like, proper eye holes. So by doing that, what happens is the network or the nerf only needs to learn one half, so you can just duplicate that, and it's able to optimize faster. 
And camera easing is, in all these techniques, when you're generating a shape, you're sort of rendering them from different perspectives. And so if you render the back and the front, it's going to try and put a face in the back and in the front. So to try and alleviate that problem, you want it to slowly generate the shape from the front and ease that camera all the way to the back so it can do a complete face generation. And both of these together really push those results further to get you a clean, nice asset that you can maybe export. So I'm going to pass it off to Logan now, who's going to talk about some interesting shape restrictions. Thanks, Nasser. Yeah, so if you think about like the, the sort of work we're doing, there's almost, almost like two axes. One is uh, improving the quality of the shape. And you can see we're very focused on shape, right? But the quality of shape, and then there's also this idea of uh, controlling the shape. Because these aren't just assets that can live in isolation. Uh, like our example, it actually has to fit on the head of a character. Uh, and so we looked into this idea of using mesh-based constraints so that this actually, uh, I, I guess, um, abides by the avatars we're using. The way we do that is with this concept of a safe zone, uh, where the mass doesn't, can't grow out of it, uh, as well as a positive zone, which is what we want the mass to fill. Uh, this is just a simple scoring technique. As we generate the masks, uh, you can actually see a visualization of that score in red and green here. So if the nerf starts violating the safe zone, we start penalizing it. Uh, if it starts filling up the mass zone, we say thumbs up. This was inspired by a technique introduced in a repo called latent nerf. So you can go search latent nerf. Uh, and they introduced this concept of having shape guidance using a single mesh. And rather than being a safe zone and a positive zone, it was just like, hey, I want you to stay around the, the surface. Try to, try to keep it within orbit, essentially. Uh, you can see a visualization of what that, that looks like here. So you have a single mesh. You have essentially a positive score uh, inside the mesh and a negative score outside of it. If we generate a fox mask or a low poly A Blinken mask, you can see it's, it's clipping all through the head here. Um, but, but I guess. Maybe it goes without saying, but that head is the exact same scale as that head. So yeah, it's just going in and out of it. So we ran with this a little bit, introduced this dual mesh concept here. You can see our astronaut helmet safe zone and our red positive zone here. And now the masks are actually staying outside of the headspace here. We still don't have alignment with eyes necessarily. Uh, so we continue to iterate on it. And this is where we're at currently, this is that gorilla mask. Now you actually have eye holes, you have neck holes. It actually fits on the head, doesn't violate the shoulders. This also, uh, you know, as part of that building on that, we realized if we're going to have this positive uh, mesh for the neural radiance field, rather than start as a blob, most of these uh, text to 3D or generative uh, techniques start as like a Gaussian blob in the middle, just like an orb. Uh, we figured we could actually just start at a checkpoint that is a nerf of that positive mesh, which dramatically sped up uh, the process. Like it probably cut off a few minutes, like maybe like 500 to 1,000 steps of, of the optimization process. And you can see what this looks like here. So this is a GIF of us optimizing a George Washington mask. I'm going to also introduce some kind of kooky techniques. Uh, it's kind of like the emerging technology ones. I don't, know if, I don't know if these have legs, but they're cool enough that I thought we should share them with you. Uh, so in addition to having the mesh-based constraints, we realized that sometimes if the mask imply that it didn't fully cover a head, the nerf would actually hallucinate a head for us. So we asked for a gas mask or like an N95. The S, they would, we'd actually start generating a whole human head. And so we're like, you know what? Maybe we just need, need to give it a head. Maybe we need to give it essentially like a mannequin to dress. Uh, and the way we did that was actually introduce a 3D render um, that's composited, a, a traditional polygon mesh 3D render that's composited along with the neural radiance field so that as we're training using SDS or the more modern technique of um, VSD, we don't need to get into that, the techniques we're using, uh, it can take that head shape into account and build on top of it, so we can get our cyberpunk gas mask, or uh, I guess like plague masky thing, or uh, masquerade ball mask. On the flip side of things, once you actually have a neural radiance field, it needs to be turned into a mesh. Uh, traditionally, people will use uh, marching cubes. More recently, you have uh, deep marching tetrahedra. Uh, we tried a third way um, of our own design uh, that's based on voxels and quads. So uh, we had we realized we had these masks when we did marching cubes. We weren't really happy with the resolution. We tried to actually uh, refining it in image space. So we just did like a basic L2 loss where we move the verts uh, to make it as similar in image space as the nerf. Uh, and that, that led to a lot of glitches. And so you know, we took a cue from our art team who likes to work in quads. We're like, well, what if, what if instead of using triangles, we could actually do this whole thing with quads? And, it, and that's the results you see here, where at a low, low resolution, you know, it actually looks a lot more coherent. Uh, it's resolution independent. You can do this with any number of voxels. We actually start with voxels and then adjust the verts to get to the final one. The, I guess the, the one caveat here that we haven't seen before 
is preserving the quads by using a loss based on dot product. So every one of the, the faces here of this voxel are two triangles. Uh, and as we move them around, we just preserve that by penalizing the two tri the, every triangle pair falling out of sync with one another. So that's kind of where we're at right now. There's still plenty of open questions. Uh, as we alluded to earlier, there's a lot of great research in white papers. There's a lot of awesome open source work happening. We'd love to see those kind of kiss and you know, we see the same results in both of them. Uh, speed, we're at down to like 15 minutes right now. Still, that, it's not really like a flow state speed. It kind of reminds us of uh, you know, like where uh, text to video is right now or where text to image was a few years ago. And then as we alluded to, controllability is a big thing here, right? So we might start seeing, again, akin to what we're seeing with video generation, uh, going from image to mesh instead of text to mesh. We'll probably start seeing more control net like inputs where we can draw over our 3D meshes and modify them uh, or just iterate on them. Like, I guess that's part and parcel of that. And lastly, this one's actually stale because there are two text to material papers this week somewhere here in this building. Uh, but PBR materials ended up being very, very challenging. Right now we're just doing albedo. Uh, like that Gorilla Mask, there's, there's no separate like metallic or roughness texture. And that has actually been pretty challenging to do. But we'll check out what came out this week and maybe we'll see some progress there. Or maybe you guys will feel inspired and go do it yourselves and then report back. Uh, so yeah, that's us. Uh, thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>